Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace Reporting live here at Birdland here in New York City. Saxophonist and composer David Murray has been a trailblazer and pioneer for the last 35 years. During the mid-1970s, he was part of that whole free jazz loft movement here in New York City where it gave musicians an opportunity to play music and jazz at a time where a lot of the jazz clubs were closing here in New York City. He's the co-founder of the World Saxophone Quartet and tonight he's playing selections with the big band. His latest recording is a Latin big band tribute to the legendary Nat King Cole. <laughs> decided to record a tribute to Nat King Cole and you did it in a Latin form. How did that come about? Well, you know, Nat King Cole had recorded uh, two, two uh, uh, albums back in, in between 1958 when he started and that was, the, that was the, the year that the revolution took place in Havana in Cuba. And so uh, when, I was, when I was down in Cuba recording, I noticed that in the studio he ground, there was a picture of Nat, and he was recording there, you know. And uh, But they don't mention that on the album, but he was actually in the studio recording. They started recording during that time, then the revolution hit, and uh, Castro took over, took over Havana, and uh, everything changed. So they couldn't finish the recording there, they took it to Capitol. In, uh, in L.A. and in Mexico City, and they recorded it. But they did not one, but two albums, one in 58, you know, and they ended, I think they did the last one in 61 or 62. He had a, uh, a Spanish manager, and he was very adamant that, to the fact that uh, Nat could open up another side of his career by singing in Spanish. So that was the concept, Nat King Cole in Espanol. And he did, he, he sang all those popular songs, Cachito, El Bodeguero, all these songs that I recorded. I, I picked the most popular ones, you know, and uh, recorded them. And, and uh, I became the voice of him on my tenor saxophone. And, uh, you know, and then the, the last concert we did in Paris, we did a tour uh, in Istanbul, Belgium, uh, Brussels. Um, in a concert in Paris at the Sao Playel and with Omar de Portundo. Now, Omar de Portundo is a woman, she's 81 years old. He's a woman with uh, the Buena Vista Social Club. And so she, uh, she, she sang with that. So I was, it was a, she was the link. I mean, it, it really made a big difference to her performing with her. Uh, you could probably see it on YouTube now, uh, some of the clips of what we did. Thank you. 
father was a guitarist and your brothers you guys played in church church of yeah, god in christ we were the band yeah we, we were the band the church didn't get started unless we were there pretty much so tell me how you were able to really start getting influenced or was influenced by jazz also playing gospel music at the time well you know I, when my mother died when i was 13 things loosened up a little bit you know i mean uh in terms of me playing jazz in the house, there was a whole thing about I couldn't play jazz in the house because we was gospel house, you know, and she played piano. She was a choir director, you know, she's the music director at the church. So, you know, that went on for a while. And then my mother got sick and she died of cancer at 13. And then, then it was just all, it was just boys. It was all, it was my three brothers and my my two brothers and my father, you know, it was just, it was just, Four guys, you know, trying to make it without the, without the woman of the family. She had left us. Uh, she died. And so uh, things got a little looser. My father couldn't keep his reins on us because he had to work. And we had to kind of, you know, my older brother had to become, uh, you know, the, the main guy who's looking out for me and my younger brother. Um, so we had, I had more, I had more, uh, um, have more time. I mean, I, I did. I, I wouldn't. I, I stopped getting caught playing jazz, and you know, you know, finally I could put my cold train on and play along with the record. I put on Sonny Rollins and play and do transcription. I, I started being able to play at home and wouldn't have to go over somebody's house to like practice jazz. <laughs> took your influences, Paul Gonzalez, Albert Eiler, Coleman Hawkins, and you kind of took what they did and flipped it and made it your style, free jazz. How did you do that? Well, you know, I, I, uh, when we have great people in front of us, um, all tenor saxophone players, so it's kind of like a society of appreciation where, you know, um, if I were a writer, you know, I would have had to study Chaucer and I'd have to study, uh, study uh, Lord Barone and I'd have to study, uh, you know, all of the Keats and all these people that are great writers in history. Um, so when you're dealing with the tenor saxophone, you have, you have the same kind of um, uh, icons in front of you. I mean, you have to study all of them in order to figure out where you want to go and then once you once you get where you are or you get the sound you want then you don't have to study them anymore and maybe sometime you pay tribute to them what was it about albert and archie shep and paul gonzalez that stuck out what you kind of switched and made it yours um well um uh well i think it's the times the times themselves i mean you can't repeat what they did 
but you have to kind of uh, you got to contemporize what they've done if you want to be in the tradition. I'm a strong in the tradition. I, I, I always contend and I tell my students that, you know, uh, the history of jazz is very short, so you should know all of it. So this, everything that's happened in jazz, don't, don't just put your, all your marbles in one decade of jazz, because jazz itself is a very short history compared to the history of music. You know, European history uh, uh, is is much longer than than uh, than African American history, but then you have to also. But then, with the pleasure that you have is that African music history is, is much more has more history. And if you st really study music, you have to include Africa because you're an African first of all, and Chinese as well. You can't forget about the Chinese because their, music, their tradition is large and vast, and the Indians. You have to consider the whole world of music. So that's why um, I always think that, you know, like Ornette Coleman says, and Blood Omar always say, jazz is the teacher, but funk is the preacher. And that kind of sums it up for me. You know, anytime you put jazz inside of folk music, any kind of folk music, it seems like it comes out a lot more rich than it went in. During the 1970s, after you finished college, you moved to New York City, and you and a handful of musicians were part of the loft jazz movement during the mid-70s. Paint a picture of what New York was like at the time as far as jazz clubs and for musicians like yourself well, to play. Well, jazz, there was just two factions of music at that time. It was the bebop. Cats were playing bebop. There were musicians. They they were they had chose up sides, kind of like the Democrats and the Republicans. They, it was definitely partisan, you know. Uh, so, the music of the so-called avant-garde players uh, was relegated to playing in people's lofts, and that's how loft jazz came about. And I just happened to be one of the progenitors because I had a lot of energy and put up flyers and go play. How has that changed jazz as far as? Well, we, we built up an audience, and uh, finally they had to let us back in the clubs because we brought our people, our own people, with us. We had made a coalition, very, very, very similar to what the young people today have done with rap. You know, they they built an audience, and so when you build an audience, when you're a producer, you sell, start selling the stuff out of the back of your trunk. And finally, you build an audience, and then the, the record company have to take you because, in fact, you start producing for them. And uh, they have to take you because you're popular in the community. David, you have recorded well over 150 albums, mm -hmm. but you have also been a pioneer of forging forward with octets, big band like you're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that you feel comfortable doing as a musician and as a composer now, where you are right now in music? Well, you know, it all starts with the tenor saxophone, but that's just a springboard to, to get into um, the writing music and, and leading others. You know, basically I'm, a, basically, I'm a pretty good leader. I mean, that's what I do best. I mean, I, I used to play football. I used to lead on the football field. Now I'm leading here. I mean, it's the same kind of difference. It's a team effort. You know, it's like uh, I take the same kind of attitude as, you know, I had when I was playing defensive back and, and running tailback. It's the same kind of thing. You lead by example. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace Reporting live here at Birdland here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Dave Murray for his time as well as the staff here at Birdland. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Peace.